Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is away. Tonight, we go to the biggest coronavirus cluster in North America, not far from the Canadian border. And we're taking this situation extremely seriously. Six deaths in three days near Seattle, but even more concerning, the virus is spreading through the community. Backing Biden, candidates drop out ahead of Super Tuesday, but is it enough to change the race? Desperate and vulnerable. All we want is that baby and we'll do anything for it. People using surrogates feel they're being taken advantage of. A CBC News investigation. And a small maritime village in decline until... We had no idea we would have so many people calling us. Why people are suddenly moving to Macadam, New Brunswick. This is The National. Canada has now recorded 27 cases of coronavirus with three new infections reported in the Toronto area today, all of them connected to international travel. And while the numbers slowly tick up in this country, they seem to be dropping in China. But what increasingly worries global health officials are other outbreak centers. The epidemics in the Republic of um, uh, Korea, Italy, Iran, and Japan are our greatest concern. Those four countries collectively account for over 8,000 infections. Iran is scrambling to distribute donated medical supplies. Some Italian universities are even turning to digital courses. South Korea's disinfection teams are out in force. It's even launched drive-through testing centers. While in the United States, President Trump is leaning harder on medical scientists to hurry their work. We've asked them to accelerate whatever they're doing in terms of a vaccine. And U.S. health officials are especially concerned about an outbreak cluster in Washington state. It started at a nursing home in the Seattle area and does not appear to be travel related, meaning it's spreading internally on its own. At least six people have died so far. Greg Rasmussen is in Kirkland, Washington tonight with more on that. Four of the people who died were from the Life Care Center. Colleen Mallory is worried about her elderly mother. Her roommate was very sick. Um, they were isolated to her room, um, not allowed to go out in the hall or to the dining room or anywhere. Well, I found out today that her roommate has been taken out of there. So I'm assuming she has a virus. All of those who died were admitted to the Evergreen Health Center, which is isolating new patients and taking extra measures to protect frontline workers. We expect the number of cases will continue to increase in the coming days and weeks, and we're taking this situation extremely seriously. Also, there's growing concern over person-to-person -person spread in the community. Unfortunately, we are now starting uh, to find more COVID-19 cases in Washington. Um, that appear to be acquired locally here in Washington. Um, and we now know that the virus is actively spreading um, in some communities here in Washington. On the streets, some are on edge. So when we were at Costco yesterday, they didn't have any rice and they didn't have any flour. This man is in the high risk category, over 60 with a compromised immune system. We don't go to events. Uh, we were gonna go to a movie theater the other day and we canceled that. Because you have no control about who's around you and um, or the surfaces and cleanliness disinfecting that's a really big deal others are stockpiling supplies i just saw the news uh, this morning like more people got the virus with not enough spare hospital beds the state's governor announced they're buying an entire motel to house people facing quarantine we have moved to a new stage in the fight to contain mitigate and manage this outbreak for officials, the balancing act here is to get people to take this seriously enough that they take precautions, but not so much that they panic. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Kirkland, Washington. And new coronavirus cases are prompting Canadian officials to rethink travel from heavily infected countries, even as some feel entering this country is almost too easy. Vicodopia explains. Gary and Teresa Isaacs aren't seeing any visitors. They've cut themselves off from the outside since returning from a trip to Japan and South Korea five days ago. They feel fine, but still canceled a welcome home dinner with family. I mean, if we had gone to that 
and you know infected someone else and they got sick i mean we would have felt terrible about that south korea is now the worst affected country outside of china when the isaacs landed in canada on wednesday gary says border officials didn't ask about their travels there were no questions on you know were you in seoul do you have any symptoms no direction should you self-quarantine or anything like that it's a different story for travelers from Iran, with new measures announced today. Iran is still struggling to contain the outbreak, so Canada now wants anyone coming from the country to isolate themselves for two weeks. But not Japan or South Korea, or at least not yet. Every traveler, every Canadian has a role to play. So if you are traveling or have traveled, this is the right thing to do. I think that it's very difficult to just keep adding uh, many, many different countries to specific messaging. For questions, those who are... The World Health Organization had the same message. Let's calm down and do the right things. The WHO again resisted calls to declare a pandemic, saying that should only happen if the international community fails to stop new infections from continuing to cross borders. In some places, we're not seeing the level of uh, response that we expected. The window of opportunity is narrowing. A window for the world and Canada to control an outbreak that continues to spread. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. So for more on what these new developments mean for Canadians, I'm joined by Dr. Colin Lee. You are a specialist in public health and infectious disease. Curious off the bat, do you think Canada should be doing more at the port points of entry, uh, taking temperatures or asking more questions? Certainly as the outbreak progresses and there's more countries that are affected, we could screen for more countries, but we also know that as this occurs, the screening is just going to be less effective because there's just so many people coming in. So it is a bit of a, a catch-22. Uh, you can do more, but it will be less effective. You know, there's a, there's a video making the rounds today of the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, we'll play a little bit of it, be, going in for a handshake with a colleague and being rejected, <laughs> and it's, it's clear she thinks that's a good idea. At, at what point does Canada gently have a conversation with Canadians about maybe taking a pass on the handshakes for a while? I mean, this can start now, really, because there's lots of cultures do different things. I, I remember uh, during the last pandemic we were doing uh, the elbow bump. Mm -hmm. um, in the other cultures, it's hands together. Other cultures, it's a bowing. So I think it's not unreasonable to start now. We just don't want to get ill. And, and second of all, if you shake someone's hand, you're going to have to wash your hands. And it's just not practical. So it could start now. It could start later. I don't think it, there's, a, there's a rule to that. There's no downside to There's it. no downside. As long as, long as everyone understands it. I'm just shaking, not shaking your hands. I just don't want to wash my hand again. Right? And in addition to washing their hands, which we know is, is always good advice, is there one or two other things Canadians could and should be doing right now. Not, not to be scared, but, but just to right. be smart. So I think the, the one thing that we should be prepared is that there's going to be a good likelihood there's going to be more illnesses. So we have to prepare a household. So that how are we going to take care of multiple people ill? And then our businesses. If you have a lot of people ill away, how are you going to accommodate that? Are people going to be able to do other functions for those ill people? And how are people going to be able to work from home? So think, we have to think about those plans right now. All right, Dr. Lee, thanks very much. And now to another story where fear is a bit of a factor. Justin Trudeau spoke with mining executives today and tried to send a reassuring message. Tensions between resource industries and environmental activists have reached great heights in recent weeks. Here's David Cochran with the Prime Minister's plan to try to move forward. An anxious audience in an uncertain time for heavy industry and a period of political unrest for a prime minister. What we need to do is build common ground. But common ground has been in short supply when it comes to climate and the economy. This mining conference was targeted by protesters this weekend, building on the blockades and barricades that stop trains across the country. All of it fueling a climate of uncertainty that, a week ago, led to the shelving of Alberta's tech frontier oil sands mine. I don't know why the government of Canada has been unable to get its act together on these issues. But let's look so in this speech, Trudeau outlined a process to get Canada's act together. In the coming year, we want to hear from you on how Canada should innovate and transform our economy to keep good jobs here and create new ones. 
the start of consultations with industry, Indigenous people and all Canadians on how to get to net zero emissions by 2050 without crippling growth. The global economy is rapidly changing. Not just the global economy, but global finance as well. The giants of private equity are changing their investment strategies in response to climate change, making heavy emitting projects like the oil sands less viable unless they are backstopped by a clear environmental plan. And for a country like Canada, where the national economy was built on the natural resources sector, there's a big transformation ahead. A big transformation and some big conversations. Trudeau will bring this same message to the table next week when he sits down with Canada's premiers and national Indigenous leaders. And federal sources say those words will be backed up by specific measures in the upcoming budget. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Three Conservative leadership candidates are vowing to topple Trudeau's government as soon as they can. Peter McKay, the perceived front-runner, sent out a fundraising letter saying we need an election in October. That was followed a few hours later by Aaron O'Toole, who promised to table a non-confidence motion at the first opportunity. Both follow Marilyn Gladue's pledge made last week in a social media post. But no matter who wins, the Tories do not have enough seats on their own to bring down the Liberals. In the U.S. presidential race, a pair of boosts tonight for Joe Biden, both from former rivals. I'm looking for a president who will draw out what is best in each of us. And I'm encouraging everybody who is part of my campaign to join me because we have found that leader in Vice President, soon to be President, Joe Biden. Pete Buttigieg's endorsement comes a day after he ended his campaign. Also endorsing Biden, Amy Klobuchar. All this following Saturday's big win for Biden in South Carolina. Biden's next big challenge is tomorrow, Super Tuesday, when Democrats in 14 states choose their nominee. Susan Ormiston went to one of those states, North Carolina, where Biden and Bernie Sanders are close, but there's a wild card. Hoop dreams in Charlotte as college ball players battle for a championship. And it's not the only high-stakes matchup in North Carolina. Off-court, Democrats are mulling their choice to beat Donald Trump. I would say Bernie Sanders. It seems like he keeps his promise. Um, he's for the black community. Biden was my favorite. Uh, Bloomberg has a lot going on. Just one basket conceal a championship. And in 2016, the election here was almost as close. Donald Trump took this state away from the Democrats, but by a slim margin. And in the primaries tomorrow, this state counts for a lot of Democratic delegates, so every one of those contenders wants a piece of it. You press next and you get the first page of your ballot. You'll okay. Your... Early voting here was high. Almost a million votes cast by Sunday before this race was dramatically reshuffled. Buttigieg and Klobuchar now off the ballots, throwing votes to Biden in an obvious move to stop Bernie Sanders. He's too extreme. He's the flip side of the coin to Donald Trump. He's my way or the highway. You're here to vote, Super ma Tuesday will define this race with two or three left at the top. Doug Wilson, a political consultant, says former Vice President Joe Biden has roots here and respect. Joe Biden is very well known in this state, and he's considered the moderate as well in the state. So that's why he's polling very well. But the wild card is Mike Bloomberg in his first test on the Democratic ballot. I am running to defeat Donald Trump. Back at the basketball fan fest, where future voters get some dribbling tips, celebrity barber Eric Cheek gives a free cut and his take. Depending on what side of the aisle you on, you know what I'm saying, I think everybody nervous. If number 45 get another turn, we don't know what that's going to be like. That's us. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Charlotte, North Carolina. And a little later, Susan looks at Mike Bloomberg's role in the Democratic race. I'm not afraid of Donald Trump. Donald Trump's afraid of me. Well, he's 78 years old. He doesn't want the obit to read, and then he lost. He wants the obit to read, and then he won. Analysts and voters weigh in on Bloomberg's chances and his obstacles. That's in about 15 minutes on The National. Now, Election Day in Israel came for the third time in a year, effectively a re referendum on Benjamin Netanyahu himself. 
Exit polls tonight show the country's longest-serving leader will likely hang on to his job, but with an asterisk. The CBC's Margaret Evans is in Israel. This was voting day in Tel Aviv, beachfront. Israelis get the day off to cast their ballots, and the bars and cafes were packed. Outside the polling stations, though, the mood wasn't quite so upbeat. This is a country that's been stuck on repeat. I think uh, um, very powerful people have the interest of staying put and not moving, and so we're stuck. The Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is seeking a record fifth term in office, even though he's just a few weeks away from standing trial on corruption charges. His supporters don't believe the allegations. I love Netanyahu and uh, I want him to be the Prime Minister. I think that he is like uh, perfect for Israel and, um, and I vote him third time and, uh, and it's okay. Despite the holiday feel, Israelis clearly took time to vote. Turnout 71 percent, despite worries that coronavirus fears would keep people at home. Israel has a number of confirmed cases, and 18 special voting sites were set up so people in quarantine could cast ballots. 4,000 did. In a stalemate that has lasted nearly a year now, both Netanyahu and his main challenger, Benny Gantz, of the centrist Blue and White Party, fought this final day on turnout. Gantz taking it right down to the wire in Tel Aviv as night fell. But if the exit polls are to be believed, that final push by Benny Gantz wasn't enough, and Benjamin Netanyahu is already claiming victory. But while he may have won the most seats, it's still not enough for him to claim a parliamentary majority on his own. For that, he'll have to build a big enough majority, and that's not guaranteed. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Jerusalem. Tens of thousands of Syrians have rushed to the Turkish border since Turkey opened its doors last week to migrants who want to pass through to Europe. But as the CBC's Renee Filipponi tells us, on the other side, Greek authorities are slamming the gateway shut. An already dangerous journey made even more frightening as the Greek Coast Guard fire warning shots into the water in an attempt to deter migrants from landing on its shores. Earlier, a young boy drowned on a crossing from Turkey to Greece. And here, thousands are being held back at a Turkish land border by the Greek army. Still, the desperation to get to Europe is growing. For almost four years now, Turkey has honored a deal to keep migrants from reaching Europe in exchange for billions of euros in aid. But last week, the Turkish government said enough, saying it couldn't support the ever-swelling numbers on its territory. The Greek government is accusing Turkey of using innocent people for political gain in an attempt to pressure the EU to back Turkey in the Syrian conflict. The situation in Syria has been escalating, particularly in the rebel-held province of Idlib, as the Syrian regime fights to regain control. Turkey is supporting the rebels. Today, new threats from the Turkish president to the Syrian government to withdraw. Turkey stepped up its offensive against the regime after more than 30 of its soldiers were killed last week. The fighting has displaced nearly a million people, Many are headed for the Turkish border. I acknowledge that Turkey is in a difficult situation uh, concerning the, with regards to uh, the refugees and the migrants. But uh, what we see now cannot be uh, an answer or a solution. Humanitarian groups are calling the situation at the borders heartbreaking, urging all parties to take immediate action and stop trapping people in horrid conditions. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. A CBC News investigation raises concerns about surrogacy here in Canada. All we want is that baby, and we'll do anything for it. Up next, parents who fear they paid more than they should have and why they could be criminally liable for it. A dangerous stunt shared thousands of times triggers an RCMP investigation in Nova Scotia. 
And why are so many people moving to a village in New Brunswick? We just got floored because we had no idea we would have so many people calling us. How McAdam turned it all around. We're back in two minutes. Welcome back. A CBC News investigation has found problems in Canada's growing surrogacy industry. Even though it's illegal to pay a surrogate in Canada, they can be reimbursed for their pregnancy-related expenses. But in part one of baby business, Chris Glover explains why several families fear they paid more than they should have. Since I can remember, I wanted kids. For Anna Camille Tucci, a baby almost didn't happen. In 2017, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. But this past December, a surrogate delivered her son. Tucci agreed to reimburse her a monthly maximum of nearly $2,000 for pregnancy expenses. We thought that though she would never really actually meet that max. But the surrogate did every month. Tucci had paid an agency to handle the process and the money. Canadian Fertility Consulting, or CFC. This. this expense breakdown is all she could get. This kind of made us think, wow, where is all this money coming from? With categories like $700 monthly paid out for groceries. You know, the two of us together, I don't think we spend that much. CFC's policy is to provide receipts after the birth. Canadian law says reimbursements must be pregnancy related or those paying could face 10 years in prison and a half a million dollar fine. No one wants to be in a situation where um, they're caught doing things that they weren't supposed to be doing without even knowing. We found four other families who used CFC services and have similar concerns. One father paid $5,000 for his surrogate's expenses, even though she miscarried in the first month. Oh, a lottery ticket. <laughs> we reviewed his surrogate's receipts with his lawyer and found a lottery ticket, duplicates, and many dated before he'd met his surrogate. This is not playing within the rules, so it's putting everybody at risk. A former CFC surrogate whose voice we've disguised says the agency encouraged her to submit as many receipts as possible. You just save all of your receipts from the second you're matched. Doesn't matter anything you save it. So it's a little shady, like a lot shady. CFC's owner, Leah Swanberg, is the only person in Canada to have been charged with paying surrogates. She pleaded guilty in 2013 and paid a $60,000 fine. In an initial interview, Swanberg said she now has six employees reviewing receipts. I will not take that risk for any client or any surrogate. Um, and so I am extremely diligent with my team. But later refused to address specific allegations we found. It puts us in such a vulnerable situation because, again, at the end of the day, all we want is that baby and we'll do anything for it. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. New federal regulations coming in June will introduce a form to declare expenses, but it still won't guarantee parents access to receipts prior to reimbursement. Make sure you tune in to The National tomorrow night for part two of Chris's investigation. They're, they're not breed mares, we're people. We'll get into the lack of medical standards for surrogates in Canada and show you how that could put some women at risk. Now here are some of the other stories we're watching across Canada tonight. A PEI neighbour is being hailed as a hero after he jumped into action during a house fire over the weekend. I opened up the front door and there was too much smoke. I couldn't even see in front of my face. So just came over, grabbed the ladder off the truck and put it up to the window and they climbed down, bare feet and everything. Chris Richard helped rescue two people from the top floor of the home while two others were able to escape on their own. The fire also triggered a rare warning from the fire department as they say hot clothing straight from the dryer was likely the cause. Uh, clothing that came out of the dryer didn't have time to cool, was placed on the, uh, on the sofa itself and spontaneous combust. Officials stress people allow clothing to cool before folding them or packing them tightly. What a mess. This now viral video has caught the attention of police in Nova Scotia. The driver of the car seen emerging after crashing the vehicle into the water has been identified along with some of the onlookers, onlookers heard cheering in the video. 
The RCMP say the stunt tied up valuable resources and charges are being considered against those involved. Tomorrow night's Super Tuesday will be a crucial moment for Michael Bloomberg. I am running to defeat Donald Trump. The billionaire faces voters for the first time next a closer look at an unusual campaign that could shake up the whole race. I want to thank you uh, for saving my life. And he found the stranger who jumped into action when he had a heart attack at the airport. His story ahead in tonight's moment. Welcome back. It is an expensive run for the presidency. So far, Mike Bloomberg has spent more than half a billion dollars in his bid to become the Democratic challenger to Donald Trump this fall. Well, tomorrow, Super Tuesday, will be the first chance to see whether Bloomberg's investment was worth it. Susan Ormiston now on why Bloomberg should not be counted out. New York City. Fierce, racy, and rich in some quarters. Once home to two billionaire businessmen, each with their own towers. Trump and Bloomberg. I am running to defeat Donald Trump. There's nobody I'd rather run against than little Michael, that I can tell you. When Mike Bloomberg was the mayor of New York and Donald Trump a real estate developer, they were much more friendly. Now, not so much. Mini Mike didn't do well last night. I was gonna send him a note saying it's not easy doing what I do, is it? I'm not afraid of Donald Trump. Donald Trump's afraid of me. Next year, we can have a leader who brings people together. Bloomberg jumped into the Democratic race late, and this week will be his test. A White House beset by lies, chaos, and corruption. Boom or bust. He's churned out hundreds of millions of dollars worth of TV ads and social media flooding America. A successful entrepreneur, Mike built a business with 20,000 employees. He's a disruptor, and for a while, it seemed to pay off. But political headwinds inside the party have turned into a hurricane. We are a democracy, not an oligarchy. You're not going to buy this election. He doesn't need people. He only needs bags and bags of money. The Democratic presidential debate. Then there was the first debate. Disastrous. I'd like to talk about who we're running against. A billionaire who calls women fat broads and horse-faced lesbians. And no, I'm not talking about Donald Trump. I'm talking about Mayor Bloomberg. He took a drubbing on the private agreement some women signed with his company, keeping their complaints quiet. None of them accused me of doing anything other than maybe they didn't like the joke I told. And let me just... Put, and One of the things people say is, look, Bloomberg's a billionaire. People aren't going to vote for a billionaire in this race. The election is a referendum on Trump. Political columnist John Ellis says Trump's $3 billion is trounced by Bloomberg, worth an estimated $60 billion, and he's ready to use it. Well, he's 78 years old. He doesn't want the obit to read, and then he lost. He wants the obit to read, and then he won. <laughs> so I suspect he'll spend whatever it takes to win. And Trump, how is he viewing Mini Mike? They're terrified because of the money. I mean, it, it, you know, if you're going to get out, spend six to one, and you're Trump, you know, you're terrified. You should be. I mean, they say that they're not, you know, of course, but they're terrified. He took charge, becoming a three-term mayor. Mike Bloomberg is running partly on his record as New York City mayor. Josh Levy and Haina Just Michael are supporters. Haina is a campaign volunteer. I think he's the candidate that can bring people together and not make them more divisive. And this country is kind of tightly wound right now. We're on the right shoulder in a gravelly ditch right now. And what we need to do is get back to the middle of the road where it's safe and drivable but not drive to the other side of the road and just end up in the left shoulder and gravelly ditch. Josh, do you think that he is a candidate that could attract disaffected Republicans? Absolutely. I think only Mike Bloomberg can carry a significant whack of the Republican votes. People who are disillusioned and disaffected and disgusted by Donald Trump and his policies and who feel that the Republican Party has left them. But to win, Bloomberg also needs the African-American vote. 
He's opened a campaign office here in Harlem and produced targeted ads. For hundreds of years, Americans systematically stole black lives, black freedom, and black labor. But he has a big debt to pay. As mayor, he endorsed a policing practice called stop and frisk, granting police powers to target black and Latino communities. His words at a conference back in 2015 were recently leaked out. I'm just gonna get the guns out of the hands of the people that get killed. And the way she get the guns out of the kids' hands is to throw them against the wall and frisk them. Last November at the Christian Cultural Center in Brooklyn, Bloomberg tried to make amends. Let's give a warm CCC welcome to our former mayor, Michael Bloomberg. Reverend Alfonso Bernard is an influential church leader and has known Bloomberg for more than 20 years. He was a little apprehensive because he didn't know how he would be received. Thank you, everyone. And yet he wanted to be sincere. He wanted to be received as authentic. And we eroded what we had worked so hard to build. Trust between police and communities. Trust between you and me. Did he explain the timing? Did he try to defend that it wasn't anything no. to do with running for president? Look, the time is suspect. People will have to interpret it, interpret it on their own. I realized back then I was wrong, and I'm sorry. What was the response? It was a warm, respectful reception because my congregation is taught, okay, we can forgive, but what are you going to do about it? How are you going to make amends? Because this is what people of color want to know. You're sorry, now prove it. He has the opportunity to do that. So would they vote for him? Well, you know, at the end of the day, blacks are going to have to decide who's the greatest threat, Michael Bloomberg or Donald Trump. Jim McLaughlin, a Republican strategist, worked on Bloomberg's bid for mayor, and he says Bloomberg's walk back on stop and frisk looks weak. He looks like a flip-flopper, and he looks like one of your typical politicians who's just doing and saying things to get votes. His current client is Donald Trump. He's polling for campaign 2020. The whole idea of a billionaire businessman trying to buy the Democratic primary when, who's basically, he got rich on Wall Street. I think he's not crazy leftist enough to win the Democratic primary right now. Going into Super Tuesday, it's Bernie Sanders who has the clear momentum, and the race is getting nasty. At Bloomberg's campaign offices, vandalism and graffiti. I've been in North Carolina four times since we launched our campaign a few months ago. Campaigning in North Carolina on the weekend, with no delegates yet, Bloomberg faces a long climb up. Do you not think that at some point the Democrats will say, we're so keen to beat Donald Trump, we'll go with a guy, we'll hold our nose and go with a guy like Bloomberg? Let me tell you something. There will be a civil war inside the Democratic Party. You see... You started to say there will be a civil war. Do you think... Oh, I, I think the, the Bernie Sanders folks are already talking about if they steal this from Bernie, they're not going to show up and vote. I was the mayor of the largest most populous city. Mike Bloomberg's money helped vault him this far. His second debate was better, but just. I'm the one choice that makes some sense. I have the experience, I have the resources, and I have the record. He'll have to post a win or come second in one of the states this week to even hope of competing with his New York nemesis, Donald Trump. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, New York. And tomorrow night, when results start to come in, we'll be here to talk about what it means for the U.S. and this country. We have reporters in key states and our panel of U.S. political insiders. Next, we get an educated guess on what could happen after Super Tuesday. What's going to happen in November? My model still predicts that Democrats are going to win. A political analyst tells us why the key to this election will be who votes, not who they're voting for. This is refreshing. This is what life should be. And how a village in New Brunswick managed to buck the trend and reverse a population in decline. With all the anxiety out of the United States about Super Tuesday tomorrow, political analysts are poring over their calculations 
evaluating statements, policies, and polls. But one forecaster who got it right before has a theory that it doesn't actually matter who the Democratic nominee is, that who runs means almost nothing, who votes, well, that's everything. Morning, how are you? Where they could vote early in the primary, they did. A tiny Virginia polling station, a tiny collection of voters, tiny but telling. Is there anything at this point that would stop you from voting Democrat come November? Um, no. Does it matter who the candidate is or are Democratic voters ready to get behind any nominee? Yes. Yes, I think so. <laughs> really? I yes. think so. I think they would. I, yeah, I think, to yeah, get to get the country. This administration out. out. These voters don't want to see a repeat of what happened four years ago when some Democrats were so angry Hillary Clinton was the nominee, they ended up voting for Donald Trump. 2020, the theory goes, looks to be different. Virginia political analyst Rachel Bittekoffer is not exactly shy about her forecast and that confidence is earned. What's going to happen in November? My model still predicts that Democrats are going to win. In 2018, she correctly anticipated almost to the precise number and location how Democrats would win the House in a prediction wildly different from better known analysts. Where they hedged, she was firm and right. The male-dominated world of online forecasting didn't much like that. A couple of the pundits on TV were like, oh, there's not going to be a blue wave. And I was like, these guys are going to look really wrong by the end of the night because... So last summer, she built this new model showing Democrats winning at least 278 electoral votes, and so the White House. That was before there were clear front runners. She hasn't changed her mind. Well, the Democrats have um, you know, a huge advantage right now in terms of you know, dominating suburban voters. My anticipation is that many pure independents are going to be inclined to support Democrats this time if the Democrats run a good campaign and, and frame it as a referendum on Trump. All right. So the last one before Super Tuesday. At um, Christopher Newport Trump University. And you have to figure that the Democrats learned from 2016 in terms a of... A conversation about how the world has changed from 2016 when disgruntled Bernie Sanders voters did not show up for Clinton. I think the Democrats would figure out that they're better aligned than divided, but... The again, numbers are there for the Democrats, she insists, if the party pushes um, turnout more than ever before and if it takes no voter for granted. That might be a big if. Not even all of Bittekoffer's students share her confidence. You think Trump is a two-term president? Sadly, yeah. yeah. Why? <laughs> what, what makes you so sure of that? If Sanders gets the vote, I don't think he can get the moderates. And the moderates are going to be the big, big vote in this election. I just think Trump will just get them so over so Sanders. In fact, Sanders as nominee is Bittekoffer's crucial caveat. She thinks he might scare enough Democrats away to keep Trump in the White House. Curiously, she says a strategic vice presidential choice might help. I feel like I'm on Mars. This doesn't feel like any political theory that I ever learned in school. Nobody cares about the vice president. Yes, I know, and you know, but that was before the two parties are polarized. If I were running the Democratic campaign, so I would want to make sure that African American turnout and young people's turnout is as high as possible. So I would make sure that I have somebody who's young and dynamic and racially diverse. Is that true? Do you, do you think you will yeah, actually look I at think, the VP think, nomination? Uh, yes. Well, oh, yes. I think in yes. this oh, instance yes. mm -hmm. it's going to be uh, even more relevant uh, than in past elections. Yes. Bittekoffer would have enjoyed this conversation. Voters saying what she believes, that Democrats might just have learned from 2016 and 2020 is looking like their year. And to that last point about vice presidential nominees having new meaning, keep an eye out for the likes of Senator Kamala Harris, she says, who might just show up on a ticket as a possible VP. All right, next on The National. We just got floored because we had no idea we would have so many people calling us. Why are so many people moving to McAdam, New Brunswick? How the village turned it all around. Next. Welcome back. Here are some of the stories we're watching around the world tonight. We had good meetings with the Taliban and uh, we are going to be leaving and we're going to be bringing our soldiers back home. 
That is Donald Trump pressing on with the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan despite an escalation of violence by the Taliban just days after the two sides signed a deal aimed at ending the 18-year war. A Taliban spokesman says peace talks would not go ahead unless the Afghan government releases 5,000 Taliban prisoners. And Apple has agreed to pay up to $500 million U.S to settle a lawsuit. It is accused of slowing down older iPhones to induce consumers to buy replacement models or batteries. Apple denies wrongdoing, but it is settling the case to avoid the burden and cost of litigation. Only U.S. iPhone owners will be eligible for payment. Now, to a village in New Brunswick that is bucking a national trend. A lot of towns across Canada have a dwindling population because of job losses and sometimes the lure of big cities. But tiny macadam has been growing at an impressive rate. Harry Forstell shows us what turned it around. Ron Cole has never been so busy, risking the ice in high heels for a real estate market that's red hot, drawing buyers from far and wide. Since January 1st, I think I did the count this morning, and I think there's nine that have sold just since then. Last year, the numbers were up significantly. This is my newest listing in McAdam. People are coming from Ontario. I've sold to Vancouver, um, Texas, as you've probably heard. Okay, it isn't Toronto or Vancouver. This is McAdam, a once vibrant rail town turned into a rural dead end, or at least it was. Uh, the Masonic Hall was yeah. purchased uh, by a fellow that's going to come in and put some businesses in there. Mm -hmm. Mayor Ken Stanix is running a village that is suddenly growing again, capturing the interest of property buyers and people looking for a less complicated life. We figure by the end of next summer, uh, we should be looking at about uh, 1,350 people. Really? Yeah. Wow. So it's, wow. Uh, it's really has it grown by, I want to say, 200 people over the last, yeah. uh, it'll be four years. The turnaround began when council tackled a persistent problem, the growing number of old abandoned homes. Mayor Stanix and his councillors put their heads together and came up with an idea. What if they tore down those abandoned homes and sold the lots for a dollar apiece? Well, the response was immediate and overwhelming. We just got floored because we had no idea we would have so many people calling us and trying to get a hold of a lot in McAdam. This guy just phoned. Adam and Jess Bronson heard about McAdam while living in Montreal, running their vintage patch business. They sold up and moved east in November, impressed not just by the affordable properties, but by McAdam's rural charm. There was an the older fellow on the other side of town, and we met him uh, one night. They have the Christmas tree night here, and it was, it was around Christmas, but he said, need any tools? Need to borrow my truck? Just yes. knock on my door, I'll give you yeah. a beer, and we'll get you set up. This is refreshing. This We're, is what life should be. There's still a lot to do. A Texas businessman has already spoken for this lot, and there are rumors that rail traffic may increase again as CP Rail renews the freight connection to St. John, a promising future for a village with a colorful past. Harry Forrestell, CBC News, McAdam, New Brunswick. The moment is up next, and tonight it's a life-saving mystery solved. He wanted to thank the stranger who helped when his heart stopped. Well, he's found her next. I'm hoping to find the nice person who was standing in line with me who jumped in and brought me back to life. Stefan Turgeson had quite a scare. His heart stopped in January. He was on a layover at the Toronto Pearson Airport when he dropped to the floor. A stranger performed CPR and used an automatic defibrillator to shock his heart. He didn't know who that was until today, and that's our moment. I ran across the airport, uh, got to my gate, and found that my flight was still loading and had a moment of feeling dizzy. My heart completely stopped. The paramedics who, driv who had taken me to the hospital, one of them came in the room. I was like, well, I guess you're the guy I have to thank for saving my life. And he said, well, no, actually, someone had already taken care of you. When we got there, you were already revived. It was a mystery to me. It turns out she's a paramedic, uh, works internationally, and she was on a flight to London nearby. And she you know, immediately knew I was in a cardiac arrest. And she immediately uh, started in on CPR. And by the time she was done, I was, you know, I was starting to move a little bit and breathing. And somewhere along the way, I guess she came across the CBC report. Uh, she sent me a message on Messenger. And then we both just had a little, you know, cry and talk about how, you know, 
amazing people are. And I'm hoping at some point to actually fly out uh, east and, and treat her to a, a fancy dinner or a show or something because, you know, it was light, lights out for me. This is, I'm calling it life 2.0 now. And doctors told Stefan that there was no damage to his heart because of how quickly Ingrid acted. And it seems Air Canada bumped her up to first class, as they should have. That is a national for March 2nd. Good night.